Today on Blue 58, linebacker isn't exactly a position of need for the Packers, and finding a good one is harder than you might think. In fact, some of the numbers about the 2022 class of linebackers might surprise you. Blue 58! Hello and welcome to another episode of Blue 58, the one and only podcast of thepowersweep.com. I'm your host, John Meerdink. Happy to be with you here for another episode. Though I am struggling a little bit with evaluating the NFL draft, and we'll get into that here in a second, but... First, we've got some more free agency moves, news, whatever. Uh, The Packers continue to bring back some of their own free agents. Resigning today, Justin Hollins, big fan of this move, definitely in need. Preston Smith and Kingsley and Igbaria are currently, well, really about it as far as NFL quality edge rushers go on the Packers roster. We've been higher than most, I would say, on Jonathan Garvin, but I would say that even so, counting on him to play meaningful reps is probably not the ideal way of going into this upcoming season. I, for the life of me, I don't actually even know if Jonathan Garvin's on our contract right now. Uh, if he is, they still do need help. If the, if he's not, they, well, extra need help there. And Justin Hollins appears to be positioned to provide some of that help. He is actually a pretty good edge rusher. Nine pressures on 83 pass rushers in 2022, 10.84% pressure rate. That is obviously a pretty small sample size, but it is more pressures on the exact same number of rushes as the aforementioned Jonathan Garvin. As the rate goes, it's actually better than Preston Smith on the season-long sort of trajectory there, allowing for the fact that Preston Smith had, I think, five times, more than five times as many rushes as uh, as Hollins did. Still, pretty good in, in a short burst there. And for a guy who's going to start out hopefully no higher than the Packers' third edge rusher going into the season, you could do a lot worse than that. Do have one question about how Hollins fits in with the 2023 Packers, though. Is he going to play special teams at all? Because he played eight whole snaps on special teams in 2022, and the Packers are going to need to either keep someone like Jonathan Garvin around or bring him back or whatever, or acquire somebody else like that to take up some of those reps because guys like... Hollins or Hollins or Garvin or whoever in that body type do a value for special teams. And if Hollins isn't going to play special teams, someone is going to have to be taking up those reps. Who's it going to be? Long way to go before that's really a problem. Just a question that I think of as this re-signing happens. So anyway, linebackers in the NFL draft. Finding one is hard. And really this whole draft thing is really hard. And I, I feel like as long as we've really leaned pretty heavily into the talking about the draft portion of this whole podcasting operation, I've been pretty open about the fact that I don't really know how this works. We've got a process that gives us some interesting names to talk about, but I don't know if it's any better or worse than any other approach for finding good players. And the longer I look at this, the more I wonder if anybody can consistently identify talent that other people aren't finding, other people that isn't available to other people. What I mean by that is how much better are you really as an NFL draft analyst of identifying guys that the rest of the draft community hasn't already decided are good? If you look at the top 15 picks in the draft, for instance, those are like the most covered guys, And by and large, they tend to shake out more or less how everybody assumes they will. And if you look at the top 30 or 50 prospects, as a community, as a group of people, the whole draft industrial complex has a pretty good track record of identifying guys that are good. The top 50 to 100 picks, that's where all the good players are. The vast majority of talented players come from those picks. It's really not like there are all these hidden gems out there that are just coming out of nowhere that we're we're finding. And so that makes me wonder, especially at a position like linebacker, which is on paper really simple to identify prospects for, but in practice really hard to find good guys in, is this worth anybody's time to do? I'll explain a little bit more as to exactly why I wonder about that when we get to the actual prospects here. But first... Before we kind of unveil the the rubric that we use, I want you to think back to last year. Think about guys that look like can't-miss prospects. Devin Lloyd is a perfect example at linebacker. Looking back through our notes from last year's linebacker preview episode, 
he is as clean of a linebacker's prospect as you could draw up on paper. Good size, great athleticism, wonderfully productive. He looked like a can't-miss prospect. He was the 15th player on Pro Football Focus's big board for 2022. They said stuff like this about him. Quote, this is your modern middle linebacker. He's the guy who you will never have to take off the field on passing downs and can execute whatever role you want him to between the tackles. There are very few holes in Lloyd's game. Most negatives for him are just that he's not exceptional at it like he is at another stuff. The biggest negative comes as a tackler since he possesses the tools to be a good one. End quote. That scouting report is not an exception. You can go back and look at any number of prognostications about Devin Lloyd. They all generally look about like that. People thought he was a really, really solid linebacker prospect. And then the 2022 season happened. Here's how his 2022 looked. Over the first eight games, he rarely came off the field. He played 100% of snaps in six of his first eight games. The other two games, he played 90% and 96% of the snaps. Over the last nine games, though, there were just three times he played more than 70% of the snaps. One time he played 70% exactly. There were five times where he played 60% of the snaps or fewer, and three times where he played 41% of the snaps or fewer. He became a smaller and smaller portion of the Jacksonville Jaguars game plan on defense as the season went on. In 2022, there were 50 linebackers who played at least 650 snaps on defense. And of those 50, Lloyd ranked 49th in overall pro football focus grade. And just for comparison, Quay Walker ranked 48th. And for further comparison... There were three rookies who played at least that many snaps at linebacker in 2022, and Quay Walker, one spot ahead of Devin Lloyd, was the highest graded out of the three. It's hard to find linebackers who are going to be productive as rookies, and I think it's even harder just to find guys that are going to be good. And I always like to do linebackers right after we do running backs because I think it basically boils down to the same sort of process. For one thing, having a guy who's a linebacker who's like a B grade linebacker is probably not going to be that much better for your defense than a guy who's like a C or a C plus. Unless you've got a guy who's like an A to an A plus level linebacker, I'm not sure how much he's really moving the needle for your defense overall. And finding those sorts of guys who can be one is obviously really hard. So I think it's a lot like running back, unless you've got one of those guys who looks like an absolute can't miss, like a level above uh, where Devin Lloyd was as a prospect, maybe like a Luke Keekley or something like that. You're probably better off just trying to find a bunch of different guys and keep plugging in different players until you get as close to that A level as you can, just sorting through a whole bunch of different ones. But if you're trying to narrow your field, if you're trying to narrow your pool of guys you're looking at, what would you be looking for? Like I said, it's a lot like running backs. You're going to be looking at athleticism. For me, you're going to be looking at moving mass. And you're going to want some productivity in there too. So what do those three categories look like? Well, athleticism, as with all prospects, we're only going to look at the elite testers just to narrow down our pool of players to a manageable number. So we're looking at guys who have a relative athletic score of eight or more. For moving mass, like running backs, I want you to have a speed score of 100 or more. So you got to be able to run fast while having a fair bit of weight on your frame too. I also want guys who are fairly productive, and I define productivity as being around the ball in college football. So we use our ball hawks metric. Your sacks, your, your uh, passes defensed, your interceptions, and your fumbles forced. Over your career, I want you to have at least 15 plays in those four categories total. That's a harder threshold than you would think for some guys to reach. For this year, I also added a size filter because in the past, we were getting a lot of guys falling into tier one that were like maybe like 225 pounds, which is just flat out too small, I think, to be a serious linebacker at the NFL level. So for me, I said this year and probably going forward to be in our tier one of guys, you've got to be 240 pounds or more. That bumps a guy like Deion Henley out of Washington State down to Tier 2. I think you can probably be a good linebacker at that 225 to 230 weight. But if we're looking for the really high-end guys, getting it done at that bigger weight matters. Now, to circle back to what we were saying before, 
is anybody really better at this than just the consensus? Because my tier one guys align basically with the consensus draft board. My top three guys represent three of the top five. And if Dion Henley was, or however you say his name, Dion Henley at the Washington State, State guy, was a little bit heavier, we'd have four of the top five. And if we had testing data on Drew Sanders out of Arkansas, our tier one would have just been five out of the top five. It's just a different route to the same sort of thing. If you just look at the consensus draft board from mockdraftdatabase.com, you're probably finding the top guys anyway. Just the weight of opinions is probably better than any scouting approach that you can come up with. So I'm thinking maybe next year we need to radically change how we do this. Maybe we just look at the consensus top 10 guys or so and say, which ones would we actually take if we had the opportunity? Maybe this is all simpler than we're making it out to be. Just some thoughts. Anyway, the guys that we've got. Let's talk about the Tier 1 players. Let's talk about the Tier 2 players in passing. And then there's one other guy I want to mention because I think there's a specific kind of linebacker the Packers might be looking for here. Tier 1 guys, guys that are 240 pounds or more, have a relative athletic score of 8 or more, a speed score of 100 or more, and 15 or more career ball hawks. Jack Campbell out of Iowa is our top guy here. 6'5", 246 pounds, a relative athletic score of 9.98. His 40 time of 4.65 seconds is still more than good enough at 246 pounds to put him above the 100-point threshold for speed score. That is really the only blemish in his testing numbers. He's elite everywhere else, especially in the movement stuff. For a guy who is as long and as heavy as he is, he moves, at least in the testing stuff, exceptionally well. Ball hawks are all there too. 21 total for his career, 3 sacks, 5 interceptions, 10 passes defensed, and 3 fumbles forced. If you're looking at his game overall, I like what people say about his coverage skills. His coverage grade is in the 90s or was in the 90s for his his final year at Iowa from Pro Football Focus, which is pretty unusual for a linebacker. You see one, maybe two guys at the upper end of the draft chart who are in that range every year. It's it's just not that common of a skill set. He is consistent across the board. He's reliable in every aspect of his game, it seems. There just don't seem to be obvious holes here. And on top of all that, he's got great size, six foot five, 246 pounds. Looks really, really good. If you're looking at the flip side, the testing numbers were great, but people still consistently question his play speed. That shows up a little bit in the 465 number. But I think if you're looking at play speed, stuff like the agility stuff is going to have to play in a little bit too because that's going to slow you down on the field if you're not as quick in your change of direction in actual game situations. I think stuff like that, if he indeed is as slow like in game speed situations as some scouts say, that may limit him to a role as a two-down linebacker in the NFL, may not be on the field for those coverage situations on third down. But a guy who can be really, really consistent in the run game, can cover enough to be on the field on first and second down, like long yardage situations where you really would have to go super deep or where he's just covering short areas of the field, I think you can still have like a 10-plus year NFL career, so that doesn't worry me a whole lot. He looks like a really consistent prospect and probably someone who's not going to go in the first round anyway. If you're in a position to get Jack Campbell and you've got a need, you're probably doing pretty well. Same goes thing as as far as I can tell, for a guy like Trenton Simpson out of Clemson. He's our second guy on the board here, six foot three, two hundred and forty pounds, relative athletic score of nine eight three, ran a four five three forty yard dash. Right there with Campbell in terms of overall productivity. A little bit of a different profile though. Thirteen sacks, no interceptions, five passes defensed, and three fumbles for it. The productivity, like I said, right there with Campbell. He was used a little bit more as a pass rusher at Clemson than Campbell was at Iowa. So a little bit different flavor of linebacker, maybe more forward charging than kind of read and react, maybe involved in coverage than Campbell was. If that's the kind of linebacker you need, though, it looks like like Simpson can get that done for you. He is a little bit on the smaller side than Campbell, but not much, still plenty big. However, he doesn't do much as far as non-sack plays on the ball. Those non-sack ball hawks, just eight of them for comparison, Campbell had 18. Final guy in our top three here is Noah Sewell out of uh, Oregon. Six foot three, 253 pounds, a relative athletic score of 831. 
Ran a 4.64 in the 40-yard dash, which is, again, not great, but at 253, certainly not too bad either. He, too, had 21 and a half ball hawks, seven and a half sacks, two interceptions, nine passes defensed, and three fumbles forced. I like that kind of productivity at his weight. Like uh, like with Campbell, if you can play heavy in college ball and still be that productive, I think you're probably doing something right. There is very little fluctuation in his career-long pro football focus grades than there is with a guy like Trenton Simpson, a little bit up and down over the course of his career. Sewell is not that way. Consistently, he, he's been basically the same guy since he arrived at Oregon and started playing a significant role. He is, however, just okay in coverage. He graded out lower than both uh, Simpson and Campbell, which I think is a little bit of a concern. Probably going to end up in a like first and second down linebacker sort of situation, maybe more of a run-focused guy. But if you got a guy who can fill those holes and be uh, just lights out against the run, that still, I think, is a valuable role in the NFL to a certain extent. Heck, for a long time, basically until Quay Walker arrived, the Packers carried a guy on the roster dating back, shoot, well into basically since since the power sweep has been around, the Packers have devoted resources to having a guy like that next to their main like three down linebacker. So dating back to the Blake Martinez era, you've always had your main guy, either Blake Martinez or somebody else, and then next to him, some sort of sidekick who primarily stops the run. So let's name some names here. BJ Goodson, Antonio Morrison, and then of late Chris Barnes, and then Barnes kind of got supplanted uh, by Quay Walker. But there's always been that sort of sidekick linebacker. And if you need a guy like that, a guy like Sewell, a guy like Simpson, a guy like Campbell is going to fill it and then some. So I think you're looking at baseline level among these top three guys, somebody who's going to be really, really useful to an NFL team. I think those are three really solid guys. Diving down to tier two, you've got some other guys who are interesting, but generally just a little bit too small. And without going into everybody's height and weight here, let's just talk about some of the interesting guys I think of the rest of the class. Charlie Thomas of Georgia Tech should mention our our criteria here. Tier two guys are guys with a relative athletic score of eight or more and 15 or more career ball hawks. We take out the speed score requirement. Because again, a lot of these guys are just a little bit on the smaller side. So either they're going to have to run really well to crack 100, um, like talking low 4.4s or upper 4.3s, which does happen from time to time, or they're just not heavy enough to really make that much of a difference in terms of moving their mass. So that said, here are our tier two guys. Charlie Thomas out of Georgia Tech. He had the second most ball hawks in this class among guys that I've looked at. Really stands out at his forced fumbles. Seven forced fumbles in his career at Georgia Tech. Also down, I guess, in that area of the country, southeastern corner of the country, Owen Papo out of uh, Auburn. I probably am murdering his last name there, but just to just to give you the headline about him, even if you can't say his name right, you can probably get wowed by his number in the 40-yard dash, 439 40-yard dash, but still does weigh just 225 pounds. Jeremy Banks out of Tennessee in the same sort of ballpark, 224 pounds, but not quite as fast uh, as his counterpart at Auburn. Still was around the ball a lot and still put up pretty good numbers in the SEC despite, despite not being an overly incredible athlete. He is worth mentioning, though, in terms of his overall productivity. Dorian Williams out of Tulane, another noteworthy prospect here. 13 passes defensed in his career, second most among the guys in my sample here. DeMarvian Overshone, my favorite name in the linebacker class this year, out of Texas is next up. He was even better in sort of in terms of pass coverage productivity than Williams was. 17 passes defensed over his career uh, in college, most in my sample. Also the most tackles for loss with 32 in his career. And then finally, Dayon Henley out of Washington State. He is the only super notable guy who would have been in Tier 1 otherwise. Some of the other super small guys probably wouldn't have made it either. It would have been been pretty close, but he doesn't really stand out to me anywhere, though he is pretty highly rated in terms of um, the overall linebacker class. His most noteworthy thing is that he's actually pretty new to this linebacker game. He is a converted wide receiver and really still kind of finding his way Uh, in the position. So if he continues to grow, he's one of the top five or six consensus linebackers in this class. If he is still, you know, tapping into his potential as a linebacker, there could be a lot of runway in front of him in terms of where he can go in his NFL career. Now, I did say there was one other guy 
that I wanted to mention in terms of the linebacker class, and that would be D. Winters out of TCU. I mention him specifically because if the Packers have a need at linebacker, they really just need another, another special teamer. You've got Devondre Campbell, who is not going to be a core special teamer for you. You've got Quay Walker, who's in the same boat. He's not going to be playing, you know, 100, 150, 200 snaps, covering kicks and punts on special teams, or probably shouldn't. You've got Isaiah McDuffie, who does that, but then you probably need another guy. And they're probably either going to bring back Eric Wilson or either sign or draft late in the draft, because they do have those four seventh-round picks, a guy who's going to be filling a similar role. And if you're interested in something like that, why not consider D. Williams out of TCU? He is a special teamer if I ever saw him. Just 5'11", 227 pounds, but ran a 4'49". One of just four guys I've got in my sample with a speed score over 110. He didn't run the agility drills. Looks like just a straight liner at this point. That's basically exactly what Isaiah McDuffie was. McDuffie's a little bit taller. But if you're looking for a guy to run fast and cover kicks and punts, you're going to probably be looking for somebody in the mold of a D. Winters. The Packers have gone to the TCU well fairly recently with uh, Vernon Scott. Winters would have some over the overlap there with Scott. We have talked about Brian Gutekunst's propensity to cluster picks before, does like to go back to the well. It's possible that a guy like Winters or somebody with a similar skill set would be coming to Green Bay almost exclusively to play special teams. There are my linebackers. There are my existential questions about covering the NFL draft as well. What do you think? Is it really worth it for everybody to try to come up with their own way of, of covering the draft, or should we just pool all of our collective wisdom and see if there's any anything to learn about the top end of each position group? Something worth thinking about, if nothing else. In the meantime, that's all I've got for you in this episode of Blue 58. I appreciate you tuning in. I would appreciate it even more if you would take a second and share this episode with someone you think would enjoy it. That's going to help more people find the show and get more people involved in this conversation that you and I are having about the Green Bay Packers, which in turn is going to help all of us, me included, become smarter Packers fans. And as I always say, smarter Packers fans are better Packers fans, and better Packers fans are what we all want to be. I'm your host, John Meerdink. We'll see you next time on Blue 58.